Clean Water Act itself uh, is not a wetlands protection statute. It wasn't designed initially uh, to be uh, a wetlands protection statute. Uh, over the years, we've kind of grafted um, wetlands protection onto the framework that's provided by the Clean Water Act. So, and, and it, it's not a great fit. Uh, as you know, uh, the Clean Water Act protects uh, navigable waters. That's the scope, not just for the 404 program, but for the entire program under the Clean Water Act. Navigable waters. Well, how many wetlands can you think of that are navigable? I mean, that, that term itself doesn't fit with wetlands. You know, the Everglades are navigable if you have an airboat. Right. Right. <laughs> uh, but most wetlands, in fact, uh, are dry much of, much of the year. You know, you're, you're not going to float a boat, much less operate a boat on, on a wetland. So, so that term, navigable waters, has presented all kinds of problems. Fortunately, the Clean Water Act defines navigable waters as waters in the United States, and there's legislative history and, and uh, judicial cases that, that define or interpret the term waters of the United States uh, more broadly than navigable in fact. So, right. so we've gotten right. around it to some extent, but still we keep coming back to that term navigable waters. And, but then there's also the concept that to, what's regulated under the Clean Water Act are additions of pollutants to navigable waters. Uh, that is another concept that was conceived uh, for for a very different purpose. You know, the, uh, to protect streams. You know, the water quality of streams to to uh, prohibit industrial discharges into streams and to create a, a permitting program uh, for those kinds of discharges. That's why it, it talks about addition of pollutants. But with wetlands, you're, you're dealing with, with a, a different creature uh, because it's, it's not so much putting waste into wetlands that create the problems. It's, it's filling the wetlands or maybe draining the wetlands. Right. And you can drain wetlands uh, Theoretically, at least, without introducing, without adding a pollutant to them. Right. And we've had cases several uh, that, yes. that have, have raised that issue. Yes. Uh, so, um, as a result, a, a number of these cases have gone to the Supreme Court, and we've gotten some some very mixed results. We started off uh, with a very good result from from our perspective those of us who love wetlands. Uh, uh, in the Riverside Bayview case in 1985, uh, a 9-0 decision. The issue there was whether the Corps of Engineers had any regulatory authority over wetlands at all, since the Clean Water Act doesn't use the term wetlands itself. Uh, but the, the Corps and EPA had issued regulations that said that adjacent wetlands are waters of the United States under the Clean Water Act. So the, the issue was, was that within uh, the agency's authority under the Clean Water Act? And, and back in the days when we used to get unanimous decisions from the Supreme Court in environmental cases, uh, they actually decided uh, unanimously um, that wetlands, at least those that were adjacent to navigable, in fact, waters, uh, are within the protection of the Clean Water Act. But that didn't last very long. Um, in 2001, the Swank case came along, and there the issue was whether uh, a, a, a water that was uh, hydrologically isolated from navigable waters, truly navigable waters, uh, was within the scope of Congress's authority as well as the agency's authority under the Commerce Clause, uh, based on the theory that migratory birds used these so-called isolated water bodies uh, as habitat. And the Supreme Court, by a 5-4 decision, said these hydrologically isolated waters were never within Congress's intent, assuming that Congress even had the Commerce Clause authority, uh, that by using the term navigable waters, uh, 
it was clear that Congress intended that there be some connection to navigable, in fact, or traditionally navigable waters, or they wouldn't have used that term, navigable waters. Right. So here we were at that point. We knew that wetlands that were adjacent to traditional navigable waters were protected, and we knew that waters that were hydrologically isolated probably aren't protected, although the Supreme Court didn't go that far. Right. We knew that migratory birds wasn't the basis right. for a certain jurisdiction. But everything in between, we weren't sure about. And, and that was the Rapanos case that went to the Supreme Court in 2006. Uh, and that's when I would say uh, all hell broke loose. Uh, because we, uh, we got a decision uh, from the Supreme Court that was fractured. There was no majority. To say the least. <laughs> uh, there were four justices uh, saying one thing, four justices saying the complete opposite, and Justice Kennedy right there in the middle. And we ended up really with three different tests for determining Clean Water Act jurisdiction. Uh, one was the one advocated by the plurality uh, opinion in that case, which is that to be covered under the Clean Water Act, uh, a stream has to be relatively permanent. And with respect to wetlands, it was only wetlands that had a continuous surface connection with a relatively permanent water body. But that wasn't a majority decision. There were only four justices who thought that. Justice Kennedy didn't go along with the, with the, the four, four who were in the plurality. And he advocated what was called a significant nexus test for determining jurisdiction. He looked at a wetland or maybe wetlands in some kind of aggregate and asked whether they had a significant nexus on the biological, chemical, and physical uh, integrity of navigable, in fact, waters. And that this would be a case-by-case -case determination unless the agencies went through rulemaking uh, to determine whether, whether there's Clean Water Act jurisdiction or not. Uh, and then the other four justices who, who were called the dissent, even though there were just as many as, as in the plurality, um, they said, well, we think that if there is simply a surface hydrological connection uh, between a wetland and, and a traditional navigable water, that that's enough. But in any event, uh, because we've got this fractured decision, if the government can prove jurisdiction under either of the other two tests, right. then, then that's enough uh, to protect that water. So I consider that to be the third standard that was established by, by the Clean Water Act. Well, um, the result of that kind of fractured opinion from the Supreme Court is that there is huge uncertainty in the field among the regulated community, but among the regulating community as well, as to whether a particular wetland or, or some other water body is actually jurisdictional or not. And the first question you have to ask is, well, what test applies? What standard are we applying? Right. And we've been litigating the issue of what standard applies in the courts uh, for, for the eight years since Rapanos was decided. And the courts of appeals are all over the map. Uh, we, you've got three circuits that agree with the government's position, which was the position advocated by the four dissenting justices, which is that we can prove jurisdiction under either of the, of the standards. Right. Uh, and one circuit court of appeals has said, no, it's just the Justice Kennedy significant nexus standard. Two other circuits have said, well, the Kennedy standard is sufficient, but they didn't go so far as to say that's the only test that can be applied. And three other circuits have said, well, we don't have to decide in this particular case because the government actually satisfied both standards. So we're kind of trying to punt on which standard applies. So, you know, depending on where you are in the country, right. you're, you're not sure even at the first step of determining jurisdiction which standard applies. Figuring out what those standards means has been very, very difficult because the, the terms of art that were created by the various opinions in the Rapanos decision 
were created by the Rapanos decision. Those, right. those terms, continuous surface connection, relatively permanent and significant nexus, those are not in the Clean Water Act, and they didn't exist for the most part in the case law uh, prior to the Rapanos decision. So the agencies have, have had the burden of trying to interpret what each of those justices meant in their various opinions uh, and to apply it in the field. And that's created huge controversy uh, and has also made uh, enforcing the Clean Water Act and bringing those kinds of cases, whether administratively or civilly or, or criminally, uh, a, a very uh, challenging uh, uh, prospect. And there are potential fixes out there that, that uh, could address these problems. Mm -hmm. uh, the foremost of them is that Congress would actually uh, do a, a, a revision, an amendment to the Clean Water Act, right. and define in the statute uh, exactly what they believe should be protected under the Clean Water Act. And they wouldn't have to apply the, the standards of Rapanos, because don't forget that Rapanos was not decided on constitutional commerce clause authority grounds. It was, issue, it was uh, decided on the basis of what did Congress intend when it used the term navigable waters. So Congress could make it clear, they could go all the way back to Swank, they could say that hydrologically isolated wetlands are jurisdictional if they're used as habitat by migratory birds. Right. There would be a constitutional issue right. that would then be litigated, right. but at least it would be clear what Congress's intent was. Uh, well, Congress, as we all know, has not uh, dealt with the issue. Uh, there were, there were, was a couple years at the beginning of the Obama administration when uh, and, and the Democrats had both houses when everyone thought that maybe there, there could be a congressional fix. Um, it, it did not happen for, for a number of reasons. Uh, so that then meant that the agencies had to decide uh, how to deal with, with Rapanos. And, and uh, the primary way uh, that the agencies can try to bring some predictability and, consist and consistency to the program is through rulemaking. Right. Uh, we're now eight years after Rapanos was decided, and just last week, a proposed rule was finally published in the Federal Register. Uh, that's how long it's taken you know, EPA and the Corps of Engineers and the rest of the executive branch uh, to, to come up with a proposal. And, and anything the agencies do, by definition, is restricted by the Supreme Court's decision in Rapanos. Right, right. What the agency, because the Rapanos says what Congress intended, so the agencies have to work within those boundaries. Mm -hmm. So basically what the proposed rule does is uh, define what significant nexus means, what relatively permanent means, and what continuous surface connection means. You know, reading the minds of basically Justice Scalia and Justice Kennedy. Uh, you know, it could be that those issues will go back to the Supreme Court <laughs> and Justice Scalia and Justice Kennedy, if they're still there, will say, well, that's not what I meant. Right, right. <laughs> or we might have a completely different Supreme Court. You know, don't forget that the, the, the one approach that everyone seems to accept is Justice Kennedy's significant nexus standard. Right, right. But he was the only justice who advocated that position. Eight justices rejected that approach. Yet, it's his opinion that rules the day for the most part. 